uh, you'd be amazed what some people get up to because most of these uh, new clients, most of them are people who have been in the uh, wilderness, for want of a better word, on their own as a SMSF trustee uh, looking after their portfolio. Maybe they were a football coach before and now suddenly they're an investor. Uh, and you see what they get up to. And a lot of people are doing that in, a, uh, in isolation. So they don't have bouncing boards uh, and they don't know what's normal. They just go with whatever they've experienced. Uh, so the mistakes we constantly see are a tail of small companies. Uh, they will make an effort towards balancing a portfolio. There'll be four banks and BHP and Rio and Woolworths, Wes Farmers, Telstra. And then there'll be this tail of small companies. Uh, it seems everybody wants to find a rocket under a rock. Uh, and they think that's what the stock market's for. But this, these can be, when you're a financial planner is charging uh, whatever it is, $5,000, $10,000, clients are burning tens of thousands of dollars, especially the larger they get, the more risk they take, burning tens of thousands of dollars in mucking about in smaller companies. And the first thing, uh, first piece of advice to financial planners is stop them because uh, they end up with needing far too much vigilance. Uh, people buy stocks and think they have to hold forever because that's the, the Warren Buffett way, isn't it? Uh, so they end up with small companies that they never sell. Most small companies are volatile, they're trading stocks. So they end up with a, a lot of stocks. Uh, they don't sell either. There are a lot of stocks that will be sitting at a loss. Uh, we've had a uh, portfolio, I call, I name most of the portfolios as I send them back. We had something called the Monster Portfolio, uh, which was quite a large portfolio. But 75 stocks, uh, 40 of them had been down more than 50%. Uh, a number had gone bust and it was just buy on the latest tip and leave. So the first thing I'd say to uh, uh, people who are trying to run their own portfolios is small companies is not where it's at. Uh, if you notice small company fund managers, some of them add a lot of value because they've got good analysts paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to go and investigate these companies and they uh, watch them and they sell them. Uh, they don't necessarily sit with them but there's a lot of work involved and people are trying to do it in an amateur way uh, and most of them are cocking it up. Uh, the other thing that people do is they don't have any sort of balance. They think equities or investment is all about equities. There'll be 100% equity portfolio uh, and Australian equities as well. Uh, and really uh, some of the successful portfolios we see are balanced out. If you're going to take a longer term approach uh, or, or you are a retiree, you need to think about risk as well as reward. So some of the best portfolios we see do have a chunk in uh, exchange traded funds or managed funds or fixed interest ETFs quite a lot uh, and big stocks and then small stocks. Uh, so equity is just a small part so balancing out would be one thing. Another thing uh, that people do badly and well is some portfolios have masses of cash, 30-40% uh, of cash. Uh, if you are trying to live off your investments isn't the idea that you're invested, you know, cash is fine but uh, in the current environment you're le earning less than 1%, inflation is 1.6. For the first time in 22 uh, years you've got a negative real return by putting your money in term deposits. So cash really is a, a killer at the moment especially if someone that's uh, uh, looking for income and a retiree uh, inflation is at 1.6% that's a government fantasy. Uh, inflation is uh, whatever the petrol price is doing, food prices are doing, insurance is doing, uh, car um, uh, uh, maintenance costs are doing. We've all got our own inflation rates, not 1.6%. So people are going backwards in term deposits. Nothing wrong with that, taking no risk, but uh, you probably could do better. Some portfolios have far too much cash. Uh, otherwise, uh, lack of international exposure. You can quite easily get international exposures now through ETFs, uh, through, uh, we buy individual stocks for clients. Um, but that's where all the growth is because uh, uh, the technology sector uh, has been a huge global growth uh, industry and we're lacking it in Australia. Um, so uh, uh, diversifying internationally would be another thing. Uh, not selling would be an obvious one. Uh, people sit on uh, stocks. Um, taking or tinkering I think you might call it which is trading thinking that uh, being in and out and in and out is the way forward. No one ever goes anywhere uh, doing that. Uh, but I think the uh, most value I could tell a, 
uh, isolated SMSF trustee is take a longer term approach. We see some great long term portfolios, people that have held CSL since it uh, listed type of thing. Take a, try and take a longer term patient approach. Don't think you have to fiddle all the time. Um, uh, I would say uh, don't uh, diversify your equity portfolio. That might seem a stupid thing to say. Someone's going to take that grab and put it up on uh, uh, social media and say Marcus is an idiot. But uh, uh, the diver diversification comes through asset allocation more than equity. So really uh, buying your obvious portfolio where you go through, it's what, what I used to uh, uh, say that um, some financial advisors, what they do is they, they take the top 50, they go through, they cross out every stock that they don't understand or can't spell, uh, and then they give you that as their portfolio, which is why QBEs in everyone's portfolio has been utter disaster, um, because brokers can spell it. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the obvious portfolio isn't necessarily the best one, because uh, we happen to have weightings in banks and, and financials. People get weightings in banks and financials. Truth of the matter is, some of the best portfolios we see are people who've got a who manage the risk through diversification asset classes, and then when they go to equities, they go for growth. And uh, some of them are terribly successful. And one of the biggest problems in Australia is uh, people are investing for income. The moment you invest for income, you're going to end up with banks. We get portfolios with 50% banks in. Uh, the banks have underperformed 30, 40, and 50% against the market, the big banks, over the last five years. Uh, by, by looking for income, people are making mistakes because uh, they are focused on, they're corralled into mature, low-growth companies that are handing money back to shareholders. Now, if you go to America, uh, uh, paying a dividend is seen as failure. Uh, this is why Berkshire Hathaway, Microsoft, resisted paying dividends for decades because the culture in America is equities are for growth, fixed interest is for income. Of course, there's almost no income now from fixed interest, but uh, um, equities for growth. And if you have a, a high return on equity company, so you've got a company, say a company that's earning 20% uh, return on equity, you know, some of those wax stocks are earning 60% return on returns on equity, but uh, say 20% return on equity, what do you think is a better investor, investment? Giving it to a low growth, no growth, or negative growth banks uh, sector company, uh, that's earning a return on equity of 10% um, and paying it back to shareholders so they've got no capital to grow. Uh, is that a better investment or a company that is paying, uh, uh, earning every dollar you give them, they earn 20, 20 cents every year and uh, they don't give you any of it back. They reinvest it for another 20% growth. And this is one of the most fabulous parts of the Australian market is there are some companies, even larger ones, uh, that will uh, have high return on equity and have massively outperformed over five years, you will find hundreds of percent from stocks like CSL, Cochlear, Treasury Wine Estates, Aristocrat Leisure. Uh, they are uh, not paying yields or they're paying minimal dividends and they're reinvesting it at a high return on equity. That is proven over the long term to give you a much better long term return than investing in a, a, a low growth mature stock that's giving you the money back. What's the point in giving money back to a shareholder who can earn 0.99% in the term deposit when you can reinvest it at 20%? It makes obvious sense. So uh, possibly the last thing I would say to Australians uh, running a, um, a self-managed super fund, especially those that aren't retire, retired, especially those that don't need the income, is focus on growth. Um, because that's where the returns are rather than uh, from dividends. And uh, uh, those compound returns will vastly outstrip over the longer term. Uh, uh, if you don't need the dividends, it will vastly outstrip uh, high yielding stocks and that's possibly the biggest mistake in Australia. How do you find growth stocks? Uh, that is not too hard. The, the amount of information available on the market, searchable in an Excel spreadsheet, is, uh, um, it's already readily available a commodity. And uh, we have done a very simple, you could do a very simple search of the All Ordinaries Index. And we look at, we don't look at a PE or an earnings number. Uh, what we look at is two years history and three years some, some brokers make four-year forecasts, they, they're a bit optimistic uh, that they should do uh, a, uh, a bit overconfident. Uh, but we'll get five years of earnings growth um, and five years of dividends, dividend growth and forecasts. 
Uh, and we uh, can do a very simple search of the All Ordinaries for any company as a simple filter, because this might not be the right filter, but it's a pretty good filter. Uh, you take uh, all the companies that have got five years of uninterrupted earnings growth. So we color them blue and red. So you just look at any company with five blue numbers in earnings growth a year ago, this year, next year, year after year after on the forecast. So three years, um, three years forecast, two years history. Uh, and uh, you'll find a list comes up. And I believe a lot, of, a lot of us can reduce, we think we're fund managers who make good decisions, but actually we all have a process and we tend to go through it the whole time exactly the same way. I believe a lot of fund managers don't have a gut feel what they have is an algorithm in their head that they could actually probably put on Excel. So this could be your algorithm. You're looking for a company that has got five years uninterrupted earnings growth in the forecast and past. Uh, another good filter is five years dividend growth. Uh, in, if you're looking for income stocks, that's uh, a good one as well. But uh, when you uh, get this list out, you can then start to uh, filter it a little bit because some of them are very boring companies. Uh, you'll get regulated utilities that have got earnings growth every year, uh, but they've got return on equities of 8%, although 5% is a new sexy, 8% could be really sexy in a zero interest rate environment. Uh, but uh, they'll have low return on equity. But if you're looking for growth companies and larger growth companies, you then search by market cap. You get that group, you then search by return on equity, and you will find the list that comes out is remarkable for it's what you intuitively know to be true when you're looking for uh, gr Australian growth equities. You will find all the names there that you expect to be there. Uh, it'll start with CSL uh, and Cochlear and, and ResMed and uh, realestate.com and uh, Treasury Wine Estates, Aristocrat Leisure. And uh, it makes a fabulous portfolio and it's not hard to find. And this, uh, we, we have had some of, our, some of the portfolios we've had, uh, uh, one of the best ones had, had a lot of hybrids. Uh, he was more interested in income and, and where he held equities, he only held growth equities. He had, it's refreshing not to find an equity portfolio with a load of banks and Telstra and uh, Woolies and Wes Farms, although they've been doing okay. Uh, but uh, this guy had just uh, focused on growth and that is the portfolio that if you look at the compound growth rates of these companies, most of them have very low yields, but their returns, as long as you're prepared to sell shares to, to buy your groceries and your smashed avocado and your chocolate digestives in your retirement home, you're going to have to sell shares rather than take income into your income account. Uh, these companies will, will uh, produce far superior returns uh, because of their high return on equity and their reliability. Uh, so it's not a, a hard list to pop out of the market. I suggest everybody does it and uh, you use that list as your base case um, uh, portfolio, especially if you're not retired, especially if you've got a 20, 30 year runway now. Uh, those companies uh, are your go-to's. Um, the problem with a lot of them at the moment is the market's already onto growth uh, and CSL's hitting all-time highs. Uh, we we uh, uh, probably, uh, uh, it won't happen, but goodness, please give us a 20% correction so we can buy them. <laughs> because they all look so good at the moment and, and so expensive. Everybody's onto them, but get that list together. When that correction comes, when Trump eventually does stuff it all up for us, please, uh, we'll get all those stocks at the right price rather than the, the all-time highs. Uh, the most successful portfolio I've seen was a, a fabulous guy. He sent us a video of him woodworking, a, a woodworker, beautiful tools, brass, all arranged neatly, obviously an ordered mine. And he told the fabulous story of uh, uh, in 2007, he took out a 100 grand margin load uh, to invest in equities. And by 2010, it was down to 30,000. He was divorced and he was living on his mother's sofa. I shouldn't laugh. Uh, he was living on his mother's sofa. Uh, and he basically had a, a clean sheet. He still had 30 grand. Only money he had uh, was 30 grand left in the margin loan. And uh, he uh, had this idea that the Buddhists feel that uh, uh, you will never reach enlightenment unless uh, you have forgiven, forgiven all your worldly goods. And he'd basically done that. Uh, so he was looking for enlightenment. And uh, enlightenment came from him realizing he had nothing to lose. 
uh, and he, with his margin loan, uh, started looking after his, he, he was cynical about what the advisors told him, industry had told him, what the normal ways of investing were. So he decided, I'm going to do what I think. I'm going to take my path. Uh, I'm going to have my process. And off he went. And in 2019, he sent us his portfolio. Uh, he has a margin loan of just under a million dollars and the total portfolio is worth 3.47 million. And he's done that on his own. Uh, uh, with his own techniques and it's a it was a great lesson i asked him to write uh, uh, for our members um, what he'd done and uh, the messages were uh, that he had to go he had nothing to lose so he went full throttle foot pedal to the floor uh, spinning wheels he described it the whole time and he spent five thousand dollars a year on uh, newsletter subscriptions uh, he he went to all the fund managers and subscribed to their weekly emails. Uh, most fund managers put out a weekly, if not monthly, email telling you, telling you how they've performed and what stocks they've got and any interesting stories they've got trying to engage you. Uh, well worth having a look at. And he, he played follow the fund manager uh, as well. And if you look at his portfolio, and, and it is just, you couldn't in hindsight have written a better portfolio. He had everything from uh, started with A2M, I think was his first big success. Uh, A2 Milk said, said he worked in a Chinese area. He could see these A2 cartons everywhere. Uh, and he feels the Peter Lynch way of doing things, which is see what's successful uh, around you. Um, uh, if you read Peter Lynch's book, uh, he, he has a, a, a classroom of kids who do an investment course every year and he brings them in front of the fund managers to, to tell the fund managers what they're doing because the kids massively always outperform the uh, fund managers. What are the kids doing? And the kids were uh, um, buying stocks, hypothetically buying stocks that they knew, Mars, not Mars, Mars isn't listed, um, McDonald's, uh, uh, Pentel, their teacher had a two-handed uh, pen that had two lids, or they thought that was really clever. So they, they bought Pentel and, the, and the, they picked stock. So this guy was picking, saying, use Peter Lynch. Look around you, what's going on? I've done the same thing as well. I look for companies that have started to advertise on TV. I picked up um, Webjet like that. If you pick one stock that's trending like that, you can actually trade it. You get to know it very well. Another one recently is Hello World, similar to Webjet. Started advertising on TV. I know uh, some of the boutique fund managers had an interest, but that was his approach. Uh, but he picked up uh, you know, Wise Tech, Altium, App and Afterpay, uh, Zero. You really could not have picked better stocks. And he got it all from listening to other people, the buzz in the newsletter, the buzz from the fund managers, uh, and uh, gone with it. It's go with the flow was his idea. But these stocks, he hasn't traded and he hasn't fluted. To, uh, he's still an investor. He's not short term. He doesn't trade. He says tinkering. Uh, tinkering doesn't work. Uh, the other thing he doesn't do is he's not interested in uh, uh, sector weightings. Most of us will hold 25% in banks because they're 25. No interest in that at all. Uh, he was very taken with Hamish Douglas's uh, capital light idea, which they're the IT companies rather than if you take the difference between an IT company and a mining company. A mining company has massive capex to dig stuff out of the ground. Uh, an IT company has is capital light, who has almost no uh, expenditure. Um, uh, so he he has been very focused on uh, IT stocks information technology sector, which of course in Australia is quite small, but uh, it wasn't, he didn't have international stocks, so he focused on the right stocks uh, in the end. Um, uh, and uh, he'd kept investing in the, in the market. The moment he made money, he put it back into the market. So, uh, he, and he said there was a, a moment where you got this compound, you suddenly realize compounding works. <laughs> it's, it's accelerating away. You, know, you get away from the th tens of thousands, suddenly you're dealing in hundreds of thousands and then you're dealing in millions. The compounding works, but you've got to uh, put it back in. And unfortunately for a lot of um, SMSF uh, retirees, trust, trustees uh, running their own portfolios, they take the money out because they have to, because they're living off the income. Uh, so uh, he had the luxury of living very uh, modestly and putting the money back into the market because he had a goal. He's, and you know, I don't think he's got there, even though a lot of us would stop at three and a half million. I don't think he's got there yet. He's, he's got a goal. Uh, he's now got a 10-month-old uh, son. 
uh, and has repartnered and is looking at buying a house. And, and uh, when he lifted, he said he lifted his head up from the stock market to look at the property market when he repartnered, thinking I must, I must get a house. He couldn't believe how much they cost because he'd never really looked at them. <laughs> and he realized this is so, I'm gonna stick with the stock market, he goes, because I'm gonna make more money than sticking it in a savings account or sticking it in a house. Uh, um, uh, because I know what they're doing. But uh, he understands, uh, ultimately, if you look at his portfolio now, there's a lot of IT. There are, uh, the average PE was 89 times. Uh, the average market PE is 18 times. Um, he understands he's taking a big risk, but he understands those tech stocks. They're reinvesting all their cash flows while their PEs are so high. Um, uh, but uh, he knows there's a risk uh, that, uh, of an equity market correction. Uh, but he's lived through a few. And uh, GFC style event aside, which would change a lot of people's standard of living, you've got to accept 20% correction is quite normal. And uh, we can live with those, he could live with those. Uh, a 20% correction from three and a half million, you can live with that. Uh, what you don't want to do is, or, or, uh, what you want to do is if you get a GFC style event once in a lifetime, which means once every 10 years, uh, um, you want to be able to take advantage of it. It's not about suffering, it's about taking advantage of it. So uh, at some point he knows he's, hang out, he's hanging out there, wheel spinning, foot to the floor, uh, and uh, he might have to do something about it. But for now, uh, all power to him. Um, I would point out to him uh, uh, that uh, 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 you, have, you now have some worldly goods. <laughs> you don't want to forgive them again. So uh, uh, good luck, but when the market tips over, do please do something about it. Uh, but it also is inspiring you know, that uh, you can take risk and win. You don't just take risk and lose, which seems to be our mindset in the stock market. It's all terrible. It's not. It's great. Uh, and um, all, all power to all of you out there who are uh, trying to do that.